Let's go ahead and get started on this. All right. Um, first things first. I do want to uh, make an announcement. Uh, the math department, this is the spring semester, so the math department is going to put on the famous Calculus the Musical. So it's actually a, a, a wonderful play to kind of get you, uh, it's a comedy granted, but it's uh, to get you to understand some of the nuances uh, the, of the founders of calculus, mainly uh, Sir Isaac Newton and Leibniz. And, uh, and uh, so it, it, it's kind of fun, but you, you see what they're talking about, and there's lots of mathematical concepts to, for you guys to live and love and enjoy. And, uh, but it does require tickets, but the tickets are free, see me. Um, but it's going to be, so mark your calendars. On Monday, February 26th uh, at uh, 6.30, it's basically an hour, 6.30 till 7.30, and it'll be in a row hall, room 130. And for tickets, come see me. I'll have a stash of tickets and stuff. Yeah. 26th is tomorrow. Feb February. Uh, February. That will be like next month, darling. Okay, next month, February 26th. No, we're, we're good in the math department. We're not that good. I <laughs> know. No, it's, it's Monday, February 26th. All right. And so, uh, and uh, like I said, for more information and tickets, you can also email uh, this person, this D Taylor at uncc.edu. You will also know that as Desiree Taylor, my wife. So trust me, if you need tickets, I can get you some tickets. Is it extra credit if you go? I haven't thought that far into it. We just got the thing today, so possibly. I ain't gonna make any promises right now because you, I just got this thing and I was told to make the announcement to the class. So go ahead and put this date on your calendar and stuff like that. All right, let's go ahead and uh, get started on this stuff. Let's see here. Um, all right. Thus far, let us review from section 2.1, because I still got two problems for you guys in section 2.1 left to do before we move on to section 2.2. And after I finish this particular section 2.1, I want to make some more announcements and stuff. But section 2.1, we've talked about the slope of a tangent line. And that concept of slope of a tangent line, okay, denoted f prime of a, okay, slope of the tangent line at x equals a is denoted f prime of a. And we had two formulas for this last time, this f prime of a. These were my two formulas. F prime of A is equal to the limit as H approaches zero of F of A plus H minus F of A all over H. That was one formula. But we also had another formula. F prime of A is equal to the limit as X approaches A of F of X minus F of A over X minus A. It's going to give you the same, and it's going to be a numerical value called the derivative. This is our notation for derivative, f with a little prime on it. But we had two formulas for doing this, okay? And you guys need to know both formulas. Now, they give you the same thing, but traditionally, uh, this one is probably going to be a little harder, but it's important. But this one will probably get you the answer a little quicker. So if you want speed, this is the way to go. If you want to beef your algebra skills up, uh, this is the way to go. Okay? So, but remember, this is F prime at a particular point A, and I'm going to call that M sub T, the slope of the tangent line at that point A. So, here were our web work problems, number 10, 11, the last two from section. Um, 2.1 that I did not get to last time. Here it is. The limit as h approaches 0 of the square root of 81 plus h minus 9 divided by h represents the derivative of a function f of x equals what 
at the number a equals what? And remember, the derivative of the function at the point is this slope of the tangent line. So, we are basically going to have to take this thing and interpret it. Which two of my two formulas do we seem to be using in this particular problem? Let me back it off a little bit, guys, to see this. Which two of these two formulas do we seem to be using? The top one or the bottom one, and why? And how do you know? It's the top one. Well, how do you know? Well, it's H. That limit as H approaches 0, H in the denominator. Limit as H approaches 0, H is in the denominator. Which tells me that when I break this up, it's two parts. F of A plus H is this weird square root, and I'm going to write that down. That F of a plus h is going to match up to that square root of 81 plus h. <coughs> and the other part, f of a, has got to be 9. Now from this piece of the puzzle, and it's a game, this piece of the puzzle, we've got to figure out who's the function and what's a equal to. f of x equals fill in the blank and a equals. Well, here's the thing. I'm looking for an A plus H be written down. And I see an 81 plus H. So this A plus H is together, and the 81 plus H is together. So A plus H has got to be equal to that 81 plus H. You with me? Forcing A to be equal to what number? It's got to be the 81. Subtract H from both sides, if you will. Does that make sense? But now we need to check it. So we need to figure out what the function is. Well, what are we doing to this 81 plus h? What function do you see there? So I see a square root, and we're plugging this a plus h into it, and that is represented by x. Now I'm going to check if I got the right answer by doing that f of a and questioning whether that's going to be equal to 9. Well, a was 81, so f of 81 is supposed to be equal to 9, but according to my function, we think it's going to be the square root of x. Is that true? What's the square root of 81? Well, no, it's a positive square root. They gave it to me, so no plus or minus. You only use plus or minus when you have to de derive or come up with the square root. So this one they gave to me, this was a positive square root in the problem. So the square root of 81 is equal to 9, and the square root of 81 is 9, so that checks, so I know I got it right. So what was my function? Square root of x, and what was a? 81 for this problem. So this would be the square root of x, and a was equal to 81. There's your answer. Does that make sense? It's a game. In that same light of a game, they're going to play the same game on problem number 11 here. The limit as x approaches 6 of 2 to the x minus 64 divided by x minus 6 represents the derivative of a function f of x at a equals what? Same question, but look at this information they gave you. They gave you the limit as uh, x approaches 6 of 2 to the, to the x minus 64 over x minus 6. So which one of my two derivative formulas here are they actually using? It's going to be the bottom one because the bo bottom one has the X and it has no H's in it. And this thing has X's and no H's in it. So it's got to be the bottom one. So they're giving me this limit as X approaches 6 of 2 to the X minus 64 over X minus 6. And we know the F prime of A is equal to the limit as X approaches A of F of X minus F of A over x minus a. So, now this one's a little bit easier. Oh, what's a? 6. You're taking the limit as x approaches 6. The formula has the limit as x approaches a. Therefore, a must be equal to 6. It gets even easier. What do you think the function is going to be? Well, what you're taking the limit as x approaches a of is f of x minus some f of a divided by x minus a. I got an x minus 6 in the denominator, which kind of confirms a was 6. What do you think the function is going to be? 
it's this part up here has to match to the function. So that is 2 to the x. And then, of course, just to make sure, we better double check it. What would f of a be equal to? What's f of 6? That is 2 to the 6, which is 2 times 2 times 2 times 2 times 6 times, which is eh, 64. It checks. So the function has got to be 2 to the x, and a has got to be equal to 6. There's my answer. Yeah? So if this is a question on the test, would that check part be uh, essential what you need to add? You kind of do just to make sure you got it right. You're checking to make sure you got it right. You definitely want to double check this type of thing. But uh, uh, this thing is kind of so lame that I probably wouldn't put this one on a test question. But nevertheless, um, they're trying to get you to focus on knowing the two different formulas of derivative at a particular point called the slope of a tangent line. The derivative of uh, evaluated at a particular point is called the slope of the tangent line, and there's two formulas to be able to get that to you. Okay. Now, we're moving on to section 2.2, but I did want to finish up that last little bit that I didn't get to last time in section 2.1. Now, before we get into this section, there's another thing I want to focus on here, which is this. If you check your modules in your course calendar, according to our course calendar, when I finish up section 2.2, what are we supposed to have? A test. And I want to prove that to you. So if you come over here and find where I put the course calendar, it's up here somewhere. Course attendance record, let's see here, how to enter stuff in web work, note supply list, okay. Put it up here somewhere, let's see here. Common syllabus. Hmm. I don't see where my course calendar is located at. Uh, Panopto videos stuff down here. Well, um, so did I put it with the syllabus? Okay, there's the syllabus. Did I put the course calendar at the bottom of it? Well, kinda. I uh, put it down here a little bit here where you got, uh, but this is just basically when my web works are due. So, uh, no. Okay. Oh yeah, there, there it is right there. Uh, but there's actually a course syllabus. I better go about double checking something or other didn't get clicked on or did get clicked on, but no worries. When is your test supposed to be? Well, not just it's supposed to be. When is your test? Monday, February the 5th, okay? And I should actually post that up here on our Canvas site. So let me go up here to our homepage. Because that being the case, I've already posted some information for you. And I'll show you how I edit this stuff. Edit, okay? So watch this. Okay, so here's your information here. Your math, so you know, if we're going to have a test real soon, i got to do something just before the test. And what is that? Traditional homework set, as I promised. Uh, somewhat traditional. We're on computer system here. Uh, math 1241, homework number one, your test number one, is, uh, is due on fr Friday at our review session, 2-2, um, uh, February the 2nd, 2018, at 3.30, okay, in Friday 121. You will find the information that you need uh, posted under modules. Now, here we go. Enter. Okay. This means that your test one will be on Tuesday. February, what day is that Tuesday on? 6th, February 6th. Year of our Lord, 2018. Oh, there we go. And let's do this. Put a big exclamation point there. And I will um, do this and make it look good for you guys. And I will make the font much bigger so a blind person can see it. All right. 
There it is, and we'll make it nice and red because it makes it look like it's being graded or something. So, and then I save it, and just wanted to make sure you understand what's going on. Here we are. Your test one is going to be on Tuesday, February 6th, and you got your homework. Now, let's take a look at this homework. Let's talk about it. So if you go to modules, you can also go to assignments on this thing and stuff. And scroll down here. You will see that I have posted, there it is, homework number one, TR stands for test review number one. It's due on February 2nd. Here's the deal. Click on it, and I'm going to give you the gist of it. All right, so I've written all this stuff about here's the deal. All right, I have uh, set up via Canvas a way for you to input your solutions as multiple choice. However, Canvas will randomize, randomize the multiple choice answers to make sure that you click on the correct answers that matches to your uh, calculations. You will just turn in the free response part of the homework number two, and here's a little link to it right here, in order to check your work and to make sure your calculations are correct. Remember, no work equals no credit. And you should always treat uh, homeworks as like a test, and so kind of take it like a test and see what you know and so you can practice and stuff. So if I click on this thing, here it is right here. And you'll notice that uh, Here's problem number one. These are all multiple choice questions and through. Problem number five and six are linked to that picture. Seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, multiple choice. Eighteen is a multiple, nineteen is a multiple, twenty multiple choice. And wait, there's more. And then, what's this part over here? This is the free response part. And I want to see your work. So I want you to show me proper techniques of limits. You know the rules. It's not just about getting the right answer, but you've got to show me the work that gets to the right answer. Well, first rule of limits is plug in a number. Second rule of limits, when you got zero over zero, you continue to write limit, you play algebra on it, so forth and so on. Show me the work. You know, those limits as x approaches infinity, you've got to multiply by one over x to the degree of the denominator. Show the proper work to get the answers, okay? And so there's lots of problems on this thing here, and there are uh, 32, keep going here, there you, use the definition derivative, this is what we're going to talk about today, uh, so forth and so on. But now, here's the deal. A lot of folks in the past have told me that, uh, man, Dr. Taylor, I have a tough time with your tests. I do real well on the free response part, but I can't seem to do any, anything better than a 60 or 55 or something on multiple choice, which just bothers me to no end because I don't know how you can do that, but some people complain about they can do better on one type of test than the other. Well, remember, I'm trying to prepare you guys for that departmental final exam, but that being said, um, the way you should take a test, whether it be multi math, math test, whether it be a multiple choice or free response, Treat them both the same way, like a free response. Don't worry about the answers. Read the problem, do the math, and when you're done, circle it and make and pray and hope that one of the answers is actually one that you actually got. If not, you screwed it up, and then you got to go back and figure out where you made a mistake on. So you treat multiple choice tests like free response tests, except we're giving you one extra little thing. We're actually giving you a plus here. We're going to tell you what the answer is. You just got to make sure you pick him out of the lineup, but you still have to do the exact same amount of work for it. Now, I know that a lot of you guys coming out of high schools these days have been programmed to take multiple choice tests, and you've been programmed to take them a certain way. You're supposed to read the question, look at the answers, and then try to work your way backwards and stuff. That may work great in some weird psychology class or something or other, but not in a math class. You treat the problem like a regular problem, do it like you're supposed to do it, circle the answer, and then go one more step from a free response, go find the answer on the multiple choice. So, here we go. This is what I did for you guys. I can click on preview here. So you should take this thing, and if you'll notice, and I actually did make a copy of this thing so you can switch them back and forth. Here is question number one, and there it is right there, and um, if I come over here to the uh, .cam and blow it up for you guys, you can see there's the same question number one. 
But here's what I'm trying to tell you about this randomized thing. The, I basically put each question into the uh, Canvas site, but what Canvas will do with the answers is randomize them. So you see here, this is A is the horizontal isomtope is Y equals 9, and the vertical isomtope is X equals 1. When I come over here to the uh, thing, it says the horizontal isomtope is Y equals 0, and the vertical isomtope is 1, X equals 1, and X equals negative 1. They mix up the answers. So get it right on the, on the sheet that you're working on, but when you input your answers, Double check. Don't it does not A doesn't match up to A. A will match up to D or something or other because they're randomizing it. Does that make sense? So when you read this thing, make sure that okay, Y equals nine, there's that was the one that I wanted. That was, I said answer was A. You know, that type of thing here. So make sure you get the right one. Does that make sense? Because there are going to be mixed up on these things. But the other thing is this. How many multiple choice questions were there? Twenty. So if I come down here, there's question number twenty. Click on it, and there it is. There's that same multiple choice question. And if you don't believe me, uh, I'll find it for you. Here's number 20, right? One more page. Here. Here's question number 20. And if I go over here and look at it, look at the question. It's something about find and simplify the difference quotient, which is that f of x plus h minus f of x all over h stuff, where there's your function. And if you go and look at this thing here, You'll notice that uh, question number 20, which is down here, is the exact same question. I mean, that's what I did. But they randomly mixed up the answers that I actually have on the hard copy. Does that make sense? That's what the computer does. But here's the big deal. The next problem is free response. You've got to show your work on this thing. No work is no credit. However, because I was in that same mindset to... Uh, um, uh, make sure you guys practice more on the multiple choice things. Make sure you guys do real well on that. If we go to the next problem here, here is the free response question. Here it is, free response question, but I made it a multiple choice question. And I made the rest of the answers a multiple choice question. So do the work. You're going to turn in this work, but here's a nice way of double checking your answer. I put the right answer up here. Go find him and click on it and turn it in. And you have to have this thing done by... Friday at what time? 3.30. 3 because that's what time I'm going to have the review session, and I'm going to go over this thing in great detail and record it for you guys so you got something to study every weekend because this is a great review for the test. If you can't make it Friday, that's all right. You can turn it in early. You can't turn it in after 3.30 because once the solutions are out there, the system's going to cut down and it cannot longer be accepted. But when it comes to this thing over here, what are you actually going to turn in? You're going to turn in this entire pamphlet? Pamphlet? Nope. You're only going to turn in the free response part because I'm going to have my grader grade these things and show you work and stuff. Does that make sense? So you, you, and then there'll be an extra grade on the grade book and all that good stuff for this part. Yes, ma'am. Is the, the hard copy of the free, spot, free response due on Tuesday or is it Friday 330? Friday at 330. Okay. Everything to do with Friday at 330. The, you putting in, inputting the answers, and you turning in the thing. Everything, that's my cutoff because that's when the review session starts. That's when I start going over the answers and recording them. And once I start recording it, once the recording is ending, I've got satellites linking up all over the place so that they go zoop right to uh, the Canvas site so the solutions are officially posted. Yeah? So if we can't make it Friday, we can turn it in. You can always turn it in early, but you can't turn it in late because solutions are out there, and that's called cheating. Does that make sense? Okay, cool deal. All right, back to where we're at here. So, again, great time because this is the last section before uh, we have the information on our test. However, that being said, well, geez, when is, the, when is this homework set due? Next Friday, not this Friday. This Friday is going to be a classic, let's go over some bunch of web work problems, classic review session. But... It's going to be due the following Friday, and your test is that following Monday. Well, what are we going to do next week? I'm going to be finishing up 2.2 today. Oh, we're going on into section 2.3 and 2.4. It's just not going to be on your test. I'm trying to buy you enough time to make sure you're caught up and you're doing real well on this stuff. So you've got time to get your web work questions answered and all this other stuff and time to get all this stuff inputted. So I decided to make the test next Monday. I always try to give you guys a weekend to study for it, especially after I go over something. Yeah. 
I meant next Tuesday. Thank you. Oh, yeah. The following class, Tuesday. Thank you. The following next Tuesday. Thank you. Does that make sense? Questions? Okay. Section 2.2. .2. Definition of derivative. A function f of x, for a function f of x, the derivative is f prime of x equals the limit as h approaches 0 of f of x plus h minus f of x all over h. Hopefully you watch the awesome pre-section video. I think it's due when? T uh, today, tonight, tonight at 1130. All right. If you haven't done it yet, get your button gear. But this is what I'm talking about. You remember these two formulas right here? These were the formula for the slope of a tangent line at a particular point. It's the derivative evaluated at a point. This is section 2.1. Section 2.2 .2 refers to what we call the definition of derivative. And that is this. Instead of actually plugging in a point, we're going to leave it in terms of arbitrary x. So this derivative in terms of arbitrary x, known as f prime of x, is equal to, and that's why the quotient formula was so important. It's uh, the limit as h approaches 0 of f of x plus h minus f of x all over h. So in comparison between these two sets of formulas here, here's the deal. These two guys, whichever formula you use, is going to give you a numerical answer. The slope is 5. The slope is negative 2 thirds. It's going to give you a numerical answer, which represents the slope of the tangent line. This is a formula for the slope of the tangent line. This thing is going to give you a function. Okay? And there's the difference between the two. In chapter 2.1, we kept beating you guys to death about the derivative at a point, which by definition is the slope of the tangent line at that point. Section 2.2, we're going to talk about the actual derivative function by using the definition of derivative. So, hopefully you watched that awesome pre-section video and you got a clue about these guys here. And I try to do one of each different kind. And if you turn your page, let's pick it up from here. And I'll do these guys of one of each different kind. And what I, what I mean by one of each different kind, let's take a look at these functions. This one, number four here, because the other ones I actually did on the pre-section video, so please watch that and take notes off of that. f of x is equal to x squared plus 3x minus 2. This is a polynomial. How do I take the derivative of a polynomial? Using the definition of derivative. The definition of derivative is this f prime of x is equal to the limit as h approaches 0 of f of x plus h minus f of x all over h. Okay? Now, we will give you f of x. f of x in this example is equal to x squared plus 3x minus 2. So we need for you to calculate what f of x plus h is. And this goes back to your high school algebra 1, algebra 2, college algebra days, whatever you guys called it, math 3 or something weird. All right, f of x is x squared plus 3x minus 2. Then what would f of x plus h be? The standard rule is I don't care what's inside that parentheses, but whatever it is, I'm going to plug it in for every x in the original f of x function. So replacing all the x's with x plus h gives me this, x plus h squared plus 3 times x plus h minus 2. Now, to do my derivative, this would be equal to the limit as h approaches 0 of f of x plus h, which is a x, excuse me, x plus h squared plus 3 times x plus h minus 2. There's f of x plus h. I just plugged it in for it. Put parentheses around it. Minus, plugging parentheses around this one, very important because of the minus out front, f of x, which is x squared plus 3x minus 2, all over h. Now, you are supposed to clean this thing up. Right now, if I plug in h equals 0, you know what you're going to get? The famous 0 over 0. So this is all about you guys doing the algebra. So this is equal to, and notice, 
proper notation. I am preparing you guys for the test. So when you show your work, as you're doing algebra, every move in algebra when you do with these limits, you have to keep writing the word limit out in front. Up until the point you plug in the number, then you don't write limit anymore. Proper notation. This is the limit as h approaches zero of. If I was going to clean this up, I'm going to have to foil the x plus h quantity squared out. Because x plus h quantity squared is x plus h times x plus h. And when you foil that out, you get x squared plus xh plus another xh makes it 2xh plus h squared. Here, I'm going to distribute the 3. That gives me plus 3x plus 3h minus 2. Here, I'm getting that negative is very important because inside that parentheses, it's going to distribute. That's going to give me negative x squared minus 3x plus 2 all over h. Does that make sense? Now, if you do this stuff right, half the stuff will cancel. Let's take a look. What cancels? X squared. X squared the plus 3x minus 3x and the minus 2 plus 2. Does that make sense? Questions? All right. What's left? This is equal to the limit as h approaches 0 of 2xh plus h squared plus 3h over h. The ultimate goal of taking the definition of derivative with this limit as h approaches 0 is to cancel out that h in the denominator. Never forget that. That's your goal. Now, I've still got that h in the denominator. However, what do I have, once I clean it up, in common in that numerator? h. I can factor it out because you've got to have strict multiplication division to cancel. So I can factor the h out. That will leave me with 2x plus h plus 3 divided by h. And then the h is cancel, leaving you with the limit as h approaches 0 of 2x plus h plus 3. And what's the last thing I do once I cancel out that, in this case, the h off the bottom? Plug it in. Plug in h is going to 0. So this would give you 2x plus 0 plus 3. And I don't write limit anymore at the point that I plug in h is 0. And so there's my answer, which is 2x plus 3. Therefore, triangular fashion means therefore, the derivative, f prime of x, we're math, we're big into labeling everything, f prime of x is equal to 2x plus 3. Listen to my words. This is what we're looking for when we say use the definition of derivative to find the root of this guy. Some of you guys have had calculus before whether it be last semester or maybe in high school or something like that. And you guys that have had calculus before know, you know, this is a pain. Look how much work I had to do with all the algebra, but we're really beefing up your algebra skills. That's really the goal here. But look how much work I had to do to get the derivative. If you do enough of these problems, just like the great masters did 400 years ago, you, they discovered an easier way to do this stuff. But we don't want you to do it the easy way. You're supposed to do it by definition of derivative. The easy way, is basically, once you catch the pattern, you can look at the question and tell what the answer is going to be. And I'll teach you that next section. And I am going to go on to the next section of stuff. But with this, we're going to end this test at the ch end of chapter 2.2 because it's still working with limits. And we're going to expect you to show us the work and the algebra on this thing. So if you just come up with an answer without the work in there, it's a 10-point problem. I've got to take off at least 15, 20 points off that. Okay? No work means no credit, and it just makes me mad. I'll take even extra points off of it. Or you know, I'm a professor. I'll get my graduate student to actually take off extra points on their papers and stuff like that. Does that make sense, though? Show the work. And this is a pain, I know, but it's going to beef up your algebra skills. It's going to help you out later. So, how nasty can these things be? Well, let's take a look at the next guy. K of x is equal to 2 divided by x. Your job, find the derivative using the definition of derivative. 
So I'm going to rewrite my definition of derivative, which would be k prime of x would be equal to the limit, as my favorite letter h goes to 0, of k of x plus h minus k of x all over h. It's the same formula, except I'm actually using the function they gave me. Instead of f, I'm using k. Okay? They gave you k of x. It is 2 divided by x. You're supposed to find k of x plus h. Now, right here is where a lot of people have difficulty with this stuff. And I don't know why. Well, I do. You like to make stuff too difficult. This is math. It's not designed to be difficult. It's not designed to be catching a pattern. Wherever there's an x, I'm going to replace it with x plus h. In this one, the original function was k of x is 2 over x. x is in the denominator. I'm going to replace x with 2 plus h. So that would mean x plus h. So that will be 2 divided by x plus h. That is what k of x plus h is. Wherever there's an x, replace it with x plus h. That simple. Don't make it difficult. Now, plug it into your formula. This is equal to the limit as h approaches 0 of 2 over x plus h minus 2 over x divided by h. Your goal is to cancel out that h. What I'm really doing up here now is showing you the pattern of the algebra. For you see, in the last problem, that was a polynomial. This problem is the problem that deals with a functional fraction, rational function, if you will. It's a fraction. How am I going to manipulate this thing to get to a fraction? Well, the first thing is this. Look at that numerator. I got a fraction minus a fraction. Well, how do you subtract fractions? You've learned that in the third grade. What's the deal? Got to have a common denominator. Look at your denominators. You've got an x plus h, and you got an x. Well, they're variables. How do we get a common denominator with variables? Well, slap them together. Multiply them together gives you the common denominator. So this would be equal to the limit as h approaches 0 of the common denominator would be x times x plus h, just multiplying my two denominators together. Now, what do I do to the denominator? i got to do the numerator. This was 2 over x plus h. We want the common denominator x times x plus h. Since I multiply by an x on the bottom, i got to multiply by an x on top, and that's going to make it 2x. The minus stays there. This numerator was 2. But look, this original fraction was 2 over x. I want to have it as a fraction of something over x times x plus h. Well, the x is there, but I must have multiplied by the x plus h. What I do to the bottom, i got to do the top. This denominator h, he stays there. We'll worry about him later. Right now, I'm just adding up the fractions in the numerator. Once you've got your common denominator, you rewrite that as one, com one big common denominator, x times x plus h, and all your math goes in the numerator. This would be 2x, watch the parentheses, minus 2 times parentheses, x plus h, and it's still all over h. I'm going to clean that up by distributing that negative 2 because I do try to get rid of as many parentheses as possible here. The limit as h approaches 0 of 2x minus 2x minus 2h over x times x plus h still all over h. What cancels? 2x is canceled. This leaves you with the limit as h approaches 0 of negative 2h divided by x times x plus h divided by h. What is the ultimate goal on doing a derivative limit, definition of derivative limit? Cancel the h's. Well, what you in essence have done in this problem when you had a fraction with that common denominator is you turn the numerator into one big fraction. Well, now I'm going to take the denominator and turn it into one big fraction by taking that h and sticking them over 1. Because of algebra, we know when we take a fraction divided by a fraction, what do we end up doing? Invert and multiply. Multiply by the reciprocal. So this ends up being equal to the limit as h approaches 0 of negative 2h over x times x plus h times inverting it, and that gives you times 1 over h. And that strict multiplication division... What's going to cancel? H's. 
H in the numerator times the H in the denominator there. This leaves you with the limit as H approaches 0 of negative 2 over X times X plus H. And once you cancel the H off the bottom, then you plug in your number. H is going to 0. So K prime of X would be equal to negative 2 over X times X plus 0. And notice I don't write limit anymore. It's not just about getting the right answer. We're interested in the proper technique of work. Limit, 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 all the way up until the point when I plug in H is 0, I don't write limit anymore. And then I clean it up. Which implies that K prime of X is equal to negative 2 divided by X plus 0 is X times X is X squared. There is my derivative. Does that make sense? We're trying to make you work your algebra skills with this stuff. So the first problem we did was a polynomial. Second problem we did was a fraction, rational function, if you will. The third problem I'm going to do is a radical. G of x is equal to the square root of 2x plus 1. Your mission, take the derivative of it by using the definition of derivative. Every one of these problems would have that stated in there, so that really forces your hand. That there, if you happen to know some kind of weird special trick you can play on this thing, nope, not allowed to use it. I gotta see some limit stuff here. So again, we're looking for g prime of x. That would be equal to the limit as h approaches zero of g of x plus h minus g of x divided by h. G of x is the square root of 2x plus 1. That means that g of x plus h would be equal to the square root of 2 times, and wherever there's an x, I replace it with x plus h, being multiplied there, plus 1. And I plug these two functions into my formula. So g prime of x would be equal to the limit as h approaches 0 of the square root of 2 times x plus h plus 1 minus g of x, which is square root of 2x plus 1 all over h. So far, so good. You know what happens right now if I plug in h is 0? 0 over 0, which means i got to do algebra on this thing. Well, let's see here. The algebra on the polynomials was actually folding it out and distributing. The algebra on the fraction, rational function one, was a common denominator. What do you think the algebra on this one is to clean this thing up? Conjugates, because it's a trick, because this is a square root problem. Square root minus the square root, we're going to do the conjugate trick. So g prime of x would be equal to the limit as h approaches 0 of the square root of 2 times x plus h plus 1 minus the square root of 2x plus 1 all over h. I'm going to multiply the numerator and the denominator by the conjugate of, obviously, the uh, rational expression here. So radical expression, the, the conjugate of the square root of 2 times x plus h plus 1 minus the square root of 2x, the square root of 2x plus 1 is going to be plus the square root of 2x plus 1. And what I do to the numerator, I got to do to the denominator. So times two square root of two times x plus h plus one plus the square root of two x plus one. I mentioned to you guys before when you're doing the conjugate trick, you always fall out conjugate pairs. Non-conjugate pairs always leave factored because somebody's going to cancel. And that's kind of the goal here. So g prime of x is equal to the limit as h approaches 0 of, here we go, what is the square root of 2 times x plus h plus 1 times the square root of 2 times x plus h plus 1? 2 times x plus h plus 1, because the square, squaring the square root cancels out. The outer, that would be plus the square root of 2 times x plus h plus 1 times the uh, other one, which is the 2x plus 1. 
the inner that's minus the square root of 2x plus 1 times the square root of 2 times x plus h plus 1. But here comes a very important trick here. And so you got that one and then the last. Here's my question. Watch this because right here is where people are going to make a careless error and it will kill them on their algebra. What is negative the square root of 2x plus 1 times positive the square root of 2x plus 1? It's going to be negative 2x plus 1, right? Well, nope, then you just died. Because you're right, positive times negative is a negative. Square root of 2x plus 1 and square root of 2x plus 1 is 2x plus 1. But you've got to put the parentheses around it because that negative is going to distribute. And if you don't put parentheses around that, you'll forget to distribute the negative and you won't be able to get the right answer because your algebra won't work out. Does that make sense? Very important. Don't forget to put parentheses around multiple terms with the positive square root times the negative square root. All over h times the square root of 2 times x plus h plus 1 plus the square root of 2x plus 1. Okay? Now, officially, I would allow this in terms of shorthand notation stuff, but when I'm actually trying to lecture to you guys, I go out of my way not to ever skip a step. Okay, because if you won't skip steps, read your textbook. It frustrates people to no end when they start reading their textbook and the uh, Dr. Stewart runs from line two to line three, but there's like 15 lines between the two, but they were trying to shorten the amount of work on that particular problem, so they'll kind of yeah, clearly from A implies B, and then you get this. And for a lot of folks, they can't get, make the connection between A and B. I try not to skip any steps. So with this falling out stuff, what always happens when you do conjugate pairs, when you multiply it out? The outer inner does what? It will always cancel. So this leaves you with g prime of x is equal to the limit as h approaches 0 of 2 times x plus 1, I'm sorry, x plus h plus 1, minus parentheses 2x plus 1, all over h times the square root of 2 times x plus h plus 1 plus the square root of 2x plus 1. I'm going to clean this thing up by doing two things. I'm going to go ahead now, I'm going to distribute the two, get rid of those parentheses, and most important, I'm going to distribute that negative. That's why that parentheses was so important. So this is going to give me g prime of x is equal to the limit as h approaches 0 of 2x plus 2h plus 1 minus 2x minus 1 all over, always leave non-conjugate um, stuff in factored form. That's h times the square root of 2x, 2 times x plus h plus 1 plus the square root of 2x plus 1. So far so good. What cancels? Once you get rid of those parentheses out of that numerator, bunches of stuff should cancel. What cancels? The 2x's cancel as well as the plus 1 minus 1 cancels. You with me? That was going to leave you with g prime of x is equal to the limit as h approaches 0 of 2h divided by h times the square root of 2 times x plus h plus 1 plus the square root of 2x plus 1. What cancels? Strict multiplication division. That's why you want to leave in factored form the non-conjugate multiplication stuff. Always leave it in factored form. Don't fall out. Yeah, only fall out conjugate pairs with this stuff. So uh, here clearly the uh, H's cancel. This leaves you with the limit as H approaches 0 of 2 divided by the uh, square root of 2 times X plus H plus 1 plus the square root of 2X plus 1. And once you cancel out those H's, then what are you going to do? Plug in 0 for H. This is going to, you don't write limit anymore. This is what we're looking for in terms of proper notation. That'll be 2 divided by the square root of 2 times X plus 0 plus 1 plus the square root of 2X plus 1. Well, let's clean that up. This is 2 divided by the square root of 2 
x plus 0 is just x. That'll be 2x plus 1 plus the square root of 2x plus 1. Now let's work your basic skills here. What is the square root of 2x plus 1 plus the square root of 2x plus 1? They are the same radical. What's a radical plus the same radical? Two, Two radicals. You just add their coefficients up front. So this gives me g prime of x being equal to 2 divided by 2 square roots of 2x plus 1. But of course, we always want to clean up our answers. What cancels? You can see this one does something cancel here. The 2's cancel. Leave me placement for 1. That implies g prime of x. The derivative is 1 over the square root of 2x plus 1. And there's my answer. So the derivative of the square root of 2x plus 1 is 1 over the square root of 2x plus 1. Does that make sense? Questions? Now i got a question for you guys. Why is this important? Knowing these derivatives, and I'll let you guys copy this as I get another nice little sheet of paper because it's a great time for motivation here. There are three formulas that you're supposed to have memorized at this point for these derivatives. F prime of A is equal to the limit as H approaches zero of F of A plus H minus F of A all over H. F prime of A is equal to the limit as X approaches A of F of X minus F of A all over X minus A. And then you got F prime of X is equal to the limit as H approaches zero of f of x plus h minus f of x all over h. Here's the deal. These two guys are going to calculate a derivative at a point which is a slope of a tangent, a tangent line at x equals a, at some point a. This is your slope guy, okay? It's going to be a numerical value. This is going to give you a function. Here's the big deal. If I tell you you got f of x is equal to x squared, uh, let's see here, what was that last problem I did here? x squared, first problem, uh, plus 3x minus 2. And I asked you, what is the slope of the tangent line at x equals 1. You know what I'm right really after here? f prime of 1. And then I would use one of these two formulas to be able to calculate that thing. Does that make sense? But what if I did this? Also, what's the slope of the tangent line at x equals 2? And the slope of the tangent line at x equals 3. That means I also want you to calculate f prime of 2 and f prime of 3. Every time I change my a, I gotta redo these two formulas and it's gonna take a long time to do it. Does that make sense? But this guy right here, the definition of derivative, this derivative is a formula for the slope of the tangent line. It's a derivative function. And as we calculated before, we got that f prime of x was equal to 2x plus 3. And if you got the functional part of it, you can switch whatever a you want to all day long, and it takes you 10 seconds to figure it out. Okay, fine. What's f prime of 1 then? That'll be 2 times 1 plus 3. Uh, that's 5. What's f prime of 2? That'll be 2 times 2 plus 3. 4 plus 3 is 7. What is f prime of 3? 2 times 3 plus... Uh, 3, that's 6, uh, plus that, that's 9. And as when you got the function, you can sit there and change your mind on what, when you want, what, which point you want the slope of the tangent line at. If, if uh, I only have one point, yeah, this would have been just as fine, and I would have gotten it. But the de definition of derivative allows me to get a functional value for these derivatives, and all I got to do is plug in the x number, and it'll give me the slope of the tangent line. Much more powerful. Yes. Well, yes, because 
I did this problem right here using the definition of derivative, and that's where I got my derivative from. If I say, listen to my words, use the definition of derivative to find the slope of the tangent line at 1, 2, and 3, and you just went from here to here because you happen to know special rule, without actually doing this type of stuff, oh, well, let's see, it's a 20-point problem. How many points am I going to take off? 40? I'm doubling it now. Okay, doubling them out of my points here. So no work means no credit. Don't worry, that's chapter 2.3 when we get there. All right, but right now, everything, so I'm trying to emphasize this, everything is about that slope of the tangent line stuff. So, let's rehash that aspect by looking at your next problem here. Now this one we stole right out of the textbook, but I kind of have to help you out with this one. This one, you're supposed to consider the graph of f of x, and you're supposed to, key word right here, real important, estimate the following, f prime of a, f prime of b, f prime of c, f prime of d, f prime of e, and f prime of f of this particular function. Now, here's what you have to do you got to put some kind of graph paper on this thing. And we didn't put the graph paper on there because every professor wants to put their own graph paper on there. So let's put some graph paper on here. All I'm going to do is move some vertical lines and some horizontal lines. I'm going to make some graphs out of this thing. So here I go. I'm going to do it very lightly. So here's horizontal line. Here's horizontal line. Okay. Here, horizontal line. Here's the horizontal line. I think I got all the ones at the top. Now I'm going to throw in some vertical lines here. I could probably put one over here just in case I wanted to. Here's one right here. Here's one. Here's one. Here's one. Here's one. And actually, there should be one right there because it makes it look almost even. Okay, there we go. So let me count. This is my x-axis, this is my y-axis, here is zero, this would be like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, here is negative one, here's negative two, here is one, two, and if you really wanted it, here's three up here, there you go. I put some great graph paper on this thing, does that make sense? And you got to do this, and on the book, they did it for you. On our notes, we didn't. So we're making, we put our own graph paper up here. Now, we're supposed to estimate f prime of a. This is the function f of x. Where's a located at? It's right here. What's f prime of a? Well, what I'm going to do in here is there's a, and I'm going to basically sketch into this thing a tangent line. Does that make sense? And it almost meets right there, so there it goes. What would the slope of that line be? Now, I seem to be hitting this point and this point. That's what I'm kind of getting, getting at here. What kind of slope is that? Because we're, we're trying to drum into your head. What is the derivative? It is the slope of the tangent line. Does that make sense? Slope of the tangent line. What kind of slope is this one? Well, basically, extend your, your tangent line until you hit two... Uh, vertices on your graph, and then figure out the slope between them. What is this? I had to go down one over one. What kind of slope is that? So I'm estimating it to be minus one. Does that make sense? Because I went down one over one. What about here at B? B's a little easier. There is the slope of the tangent line right there at B. What kind of slope is this line? It is a, what kind of line is it? It's a horizontal line. And what kind of what kind of slopes does horizontal lines have? Zero slopes. Horizontal lines have zero slopes. Vertical lines have no slope. Does not exist. Horizontal lines have zero slope. All right? F prime of C. Here's C right here. Let's see if we can't draw in that tangent line thing here. There it is right there. Kind of drew in my little tangent line as I extend it. I seem to be hitting this point and this point. What's my slope? I had to rise 2 and run 1. What does that make my slope? Positive 2. Rise over run, rows 2, run 1, 2 over 1 is 2. 
Does that make sense? It's a positive slope. What about f prime of d? f prime of d is real easy. What kind of slope is that line right there? Yep, it's zero again because it's a horizontal line. What about f prime of e? You've got 10 seconds. I didn't even need it. It's still zero. But notice something, brother. This is important. Look at the points B, D, and E. What do they all have in common? Well, here was B down here. Here was your graph. I kind of wrote all over it. Here's B. Here's E. Uh, here, I'm sorry. Here's D and here's E. All these points are what we call max-min points. Local maximums or minimums. They're, they're, they're the trough. They're, they're the high points and the low points of the, of the graph as this thing's continuous. Does that make sense? And notice, every one of them has the derivative equal to zero. That's a nice pattern we'll beat to death later. Last one. What's f prime of f? Let's draw in your tangent line here. And that seems to be a good tangent line. And what's my slope? I had to go up uh, one, two, run one. What is that? Two. Two over one, two. And again, I'm estimating it based upon how I put my grid paper on here. So there you go. Does that make sense? Question. So basically, all I'm doing is extending the tangent line, trying to mimic, draw in a tangent line, and then I'm trying to figure out the slope of the tangent line is actually the derivative at that point. Well, as we mentioned today, uh, that uh, uh, the musical, uh, calculus the musical, uh, the fact of the matter is there are two people that actually get credit for calculus. Who are those two people? Sir Isaac Newton, Newton, and a German guy named Leibniz, okay? Who actually discovered calculus first? Well, that's been a going debate on for hundreds of years of who actually discovered it first. Now, according to the mathematics people, who published first gets credit first, right? Well, guess who published first? Leibniz. Okay, and uh, and honestly, if you were from Eastern Europe or German Europe, for in particular, or especially Eastern Europe or uh, uh, West Russia, so forth and so on, if you ask any one of those guys who developed calculus, they're going to automatically tell you Leibniz did. But we're a former British colony, so when you ask us who discovered calculus, what do we say? Newton, right? Well. Because here comes the debate, and this is what that project, I mean, the calculus, the musical actually makes fun of, is the debate between the two. That, uh, yes, Leibniz published first, but uh, Newton actually wrote up his papers and he dated them uh, years earlier than uh, Leibniz published. So he actually discovered the concept, but Newton was lazy about getting his stuff published, so he didn't get it published first. And Newton just happened to be part of the Royal uh, Society of, uh, of Scientists and stuff who's in charge of deciding who gets to be declared the winner, and he declared himself the winner. So, um, therefore, Sir Isaac Newton wins the game because, according to the historical documents that they went back and looked at, and this becomes years after these people even died, uh, Newton actually wrote the stuff down first, but Leibniz published first. So, uh, give credit where credit's due. We actually give them two... Uh, both of them credit. But that being the case, you guys have to know two notations about the taking derivative. The notation with that little prime thing there is a Newtonian notation. The original notation, honestly, that uh, Newton came up with was a dot. This was his y derivative. He put a dot on top of it. But we're math people. And one thing you learn about math people is they're inherently lazy. So through the years, this dot has gone from being right on top and very prominent to somewhere on the side in a hash mark because we write it at 10,000 miles an hour, and that's just the way it turns out to be. So to this day and age, we now use a prime or a little hash mark to, uh, to do the derivative. Now, where is uh, Leibniz from? German. German. What do you know about German? Well, they can't win a world war, granted, but what else? Okay. <laughs> what else do you know about Germans? They are very technical in their concepts. 
what exactly is the derivative? The derivative is the slope of the tangent line, right? And the slope by formula is, uh, you know, change in y over the change in x, or we'd use that slope concept, we call it delta y over delta x, right? Change in y over the change in x. And so uh, this is where Leibniz got his notation because whether you're in German or English here, delta in German still starts with a d. So he calls it dy over dx for that derivative. So this is the Leibniz notation, dy over dx, that comes right off the slope formula, very detailed oriented, versus the uh, Newtonian notation. So, and of course, you guys have to know both. And of course, you can sit there, and have, uh, if the function's called little f of x, you can call the derivative uh, little f with a little prime of x. You can also call him df over dx if you want to. And this notation down here about big function to little function, we'll get to you get to that notation actually when we get to the end of calculus uh, one and start calculus two. Uh, it really works going the other way, something called an antiderivative thing here. We'll talk about that. But these are your notations and stuff. Okay. The differentiability. We say that f of x is differentiable at a point A if f prime of A exists. f of x is differentiable on an interval between A and B if, f of, if it is differentiable at every point in A and B. So what do we say when a function is differentiable? That means there, there, there is a derivative or a slope of a tangent line exists for every point in some kind of interval, a, B, a to B. Theorem. F is differentiable at A that is continuous at A. Okay? It doesn't go back the other way. Just because a function is continuous doesn't mean it's differentiable. But if it's differentiable, you automatically get continuity out of it. Okay? So, here is some examples. Non-differentiable functions. You should recognize this dude right here. What is this guy? It's the absolute value of x looking graph. Absolute value graph, right? There is a point that it's not differentiable. And let me show you. If you look at the slope of the tangent lines on the left side, what kind of slope do they have? Pretty much negative 1. What kind of slope of the tangent lines does it have on the right half? 1. This point right here, this is called a cusp or sharp turn corner. This f prime of 0 does not exist because you've got a negative derivative and a positive derivative at the same time. That can't happen. So at sharp turns, you don't have derivatives. This is also considered a cusp. It's a sharp, sharp turn. So f prime at this point A right here does not exist. So when I'm looking at graphs and I look at sharp turns or something or other, these, these jagged points, I know the derivative doesn't exist at those points. Obviously, we said uh, if it's continuous, if it's differentiable, it's continuous. Well, anytime you have a break in your function, f prime at a would not exist. Because you may have a slope of 5 over here on this side. This will be a slope of 0. Uh, they're not matched up, so we say the derivative doesn't exist every time you have a break. So also, and which, you know, classic piecewise functions as well as vertical isomptopes here, the old x equal a vertical isomptope. The, deri the function doesn't exist there, and therefore the derivative will not exist there. That's really what's going on. I also mentioned this to you guys a few seconds ago, and that was the idea behind vertical lines. Horizontal lines have zero slope. Vertical lines have what we call no slope or the slope does not exist. It's the rise over the run. It's all rise, but there's no run. You can't divide by zero. That's why it doesn't exist. So any point where you actually end up getting a vertical tangent line or a vertical line at all, this f prime of a does not exist because you can't, there's no slope to a vertical line. That's why. Does that make sense? So here's some special points where the derivative does not exist at. Cusps, breaking points where the function doesn't exist at, and vertical tangent lines, the derivative doesn't exist there either.
Now, on this is a web work problem, and I'm sorry, but if you're like me, I printed it out in uh, black and white because that's what the department pays for. Um, but these things are actually on color on, uh, on web work here. And so uh, here we go. And this is, we stole this. We cut, copied, and pasted right off of uh, web work here. Uh, identify the graphs. A is in blue, B is in red, and C is in green. Well, we don't know what the colors are, but there's A, there's B, and there's C. As graphs of a function and its derivative, you are supposed to tell me by letter which is the original function, which is the first derivative, and which is the second derivative, the derivative of the derivative. You can do multiple derivatives with this stuff. Okay? Well, first off, catch a pattern. Let me show you guys a pattern. Because this is going to set us up for the next section. You remember, this is the first limit problem I did for you guys. Hopefully you watched the pre-section video and we did a lot more. But this was a quadratic polynomial. A, a quadratic, degree 2 polynomial. When you took its derivative, what did you end up getting? Degree 2 polynomials turn into, when you take its derivative, 2x plus 3. Who cares what the coefficients are? What's the degree of it? 1. So when you take a derivative, it knocks it down by a degree. We're trying to get you guys to catch patterns on this thing. Okay? So let's take a look at these three functions and tell me what you see. I see here C right here, and it looks like a squiggle line. I can extend it over a little bit if you want me to. I see B, which looks like a what? Parabola. And I see A, which is very linear. Knowing every time we take a derivative of a function, it knocks it down by a degree. Therefore, a squiggle being a polynomial, this would be a degree 3 polynomial. Does that make sense? This is degree 3. A quadratic polynomial is a degree 2. And this last one is a linear, which means it's a degree 1 polynomial. You with me? So... Which function must have been the original function? Uh, well, the one with the highest degree, which would have been C. Which one is the first derivative? Well, you knock down a degree 3 by a power, by, by a factor of 1. That gives you a degree 2, which is which one? B. And if you take a degree 2 polynomial, a quadratic, and take its derivative, it knocks it down by a degree. And that leaves you with a degree 1, which means he is linear, which is line A. The answer is BCA on this thing. Does that make sense? Now, there's two more problems, and I, I know I'm running out of time, and I'll get to you guys next time, but these two problems, they're on your web work, but they're not Chapter 2.2 questions. They're review questions to try to get you guys set up for the test. So I will come back on Tuesday when I lecture. Remember, Friday's going to be review day on going over web work and stuff like that. These will help you guys do some practicing on uh, limits, and then we're going to start section 2.3. See you guys then.